Hebrews chapter 10 from verse 19. A call to persevere in faith. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way open for us through the curtain that is his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. If we deliberately keep on sinning after we receive the knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice for sins is left, but only a fearful expectation of judgment and of raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. Anyone who rejects directed the law of Moses died without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much more severely do you think someone deserves to be punished who has trampled the Son of God underfoot and who has treated as unholy thing the blood of the covenant that sanctified them and who has insulted the Spirit of grace? For we know him who said, It is mine to avenge, I will repay, and again the Lord will judge his people. It is a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Remember those earlier days after you had received the light when you endured in a great conflict full of suffering. Sometimes you were publicly exposed to insult and persecution. At other times you stood side by side with those who were so treated. You suffered along with those in prison and joyfully accepted the confiscation of your property because you knew that you yourselves had better and lasting possessions. So we do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. You need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, we will see what he has promised. For in just a little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay. And but my righteousness one will live by faith and I take no pleasure in the one who shrinks back. But we do not belong to those who shrink back and are destroyed, but to those who have faith and are saved. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning, everyone. It's good to be talking with you today, and um, particularly that it's my penultimate week um, working at church. And so it's such a, a great um, privilege and honour and joy to be uh, sharing with you this morning. Um, Sarah and, and, and I and the family will be in church on, uh, on next Sunday as well, uh, just to say goodbye to everyone. But uh, I'm really glad to be sharing uh, with you this morning. Um, so we are talking today, um, we are week four of the One Another Sermons. We've looked at love one another, serve one another, be in unity with one another. And today the message is to encourage one another. And, and I've, I've been asking the Lord for, for help that, that this will be not just a time of, of, of talking about encouraging one another, but actually that this would be encouraging. Um, what a great thing it'd be to to to, to leave with this this leaving message uh, as encouragement. And so, but I recognise that by myself I can do nothing. 
And so I ask the Lord to, to, to encourage each of us um, today. And so actually, Father, I just ask you now to come upon each of us, each of my brothers and sisters who are watching this today in Jesus' name. I just pray, the Lord, that your Holy Spirit would come upon us and soften our hearts and give us encouragement to, to live for you, to give you our all in all for Jesus. Um, and so we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Cool. Okay. So, so what does it mean to encourage one another? What do we mean by that? Um, what, it, what it doesn't really mean so much is uh, a classic understanding of like, oh, well done, mate, you know, you did really well, give, giving them a pass on the back. And that's, that's affirmation. And affirmation isn't encouragement. Encouragement isn't affirmation. Affirmation is a type of encouragement. It can be encouraging, but it's not the perfect definition of encouragement. Um, in a similar way to comfort someone, um, particularly in a time of need, it, it can be encouraging, but actually that's not the definition of encouragement. They're sort of the, the, the lesser meanings of the, the term encouragement. When we, when, when we talk about encouragement, particularly in this verse today, is more so that the main meat of it means to admonish one another, which, which means to, to warn one another um, and, and to plead with someone, to, 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 to sort of shake someone up a bit and, and even with a bit of a challenge. And I think of myself, you know, I'm, when someone says, oh, you know, oh well done mate, that, that was really good, it, it's, it's nice, it can be a bit encouraging, but actually I'm, I'm more encouraged when I'm challenged. Um, that, that really encourages me to, to, to drive forward and to seek something. And, um, and so we had a, a great warning um, in, our, in, our, in our reading today that Philip read. Um, when we heard the verses, if we, and this is talking to Christians, if we deliberately keep on sinning after we have received the knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice for sins is left, but only a fearful expectation of judgment and of raging fire. Now that's that in itself is encouraging, because that's that makes me be like I, I don't I don't want to I don't want to deliberately sin I don't want to face that that judgment of raging fire so it encourages me to live a holy life so that that's the encouragement that we're sort of mainly talking about today that's the encouragement of the, of the verse. Um, I think of the army when I was in the army and we did a lot of running obviously and sometimes with logs. And when you're, when you're really hanging out and you're exhausted and um, you start slowing down, someone could come up beside you and encourage you. And they'd say, you know, come on, mate, put in your effort. Yeah, I can see the finish line. It's not, you've got, you don't have much longer to go. Come on, keep on pushing. Strive harder now. Strive harder. And that, that encourages me and it encourages us to, to strive forward. So this is the final push. Come on. So that's encouragement. Um, and, and in a similar way, if, um, if it's pitch black and you see someone who's sleepwalking and they're just about to walk off a cliff, you've got to encourage them to, to sort of wake up or, or turn around. And you're not going to be like, oh, hey, hey, mate, um, wake up. It's, got, it's, it's quite forceful. Come on, wake up, sort of thing. Um, and that, that's, you've got to encourage them. And, and notice in, in these examples, the, the person who, who, who does the encouraging, the, the person who encourages has vision for what lies ahead. The person who encouraged in the race had the vision of the finish line and the prize. You've almost done, keep on going, it's the last stretch. And then the person who's walking off the cliff the person who encourages them has the vision, the foresight to see the cliff. And so they give them the warning and the danger. If we are not aware of the prize that is yet to come or the danger that lies ahead, then we won't be great encouragers. And even the world understands this. The classic sort of um, term is like, oh, don't worry, mate, it will all be okay. You know, we, we like to speak um, about the future. But encouragers are people who speak into the present because they have vision of what lies ahead. Okay, let's just understand that as the basis of what encouragement is. 
Now we all need to be encouraged. We need to be encouraged to love one another. We need to be encouraged to serve one another. And we even need to be encouraged to encourage one another. Um, so you know, if you've got someone sitting next to you, you know, that person, if they want to encourage you, they first of all need to be encouraged in order to encourage that person. Um, if, if you want to encourage someone, you've got to be encouraged to then encourage that person. And just imagine now, like as families or, or as a church, just imagine that we, let's think of church, um, let's think that we are all in a race, okay? And the faster we get to the, to the finish line, the better the prize that we get. And say we've been going on for ages, it's been a long slog, and we're thinking like, oh my gosh, is this race ever going to end? And then, and then people are starting to say like, oh, you know, we've been going for too long. I think we need to just slow down a bit and maybe reserve our energy. But say, for example, I, I was, I'm, yeah, I'm running as well, I'm with the church. Say, for example, I, um, I just saw the finish line. I would be encouraged because I've seen the finish line. And I'd say, guys, guys, it's, it's not too much further. I can see the finish line. There's only 400 meters ahead. Come on, let's put in our, our final drive now. Let's go, go, go. And then they would be encouraged. But they would only be encouraged because I was first encouraged because I had the vision for what lies ahead. Okay, so that's, that's, the, that's the same thing. And this is the same for the church. The church of Jesus Christ across the nations has had a long slog, about 1,987 years. Can't be exact on that, but it's about that. We, we're tired across the nations, and I think we need a vision. But the question is, what is the vision, and can we see it? Can we see the finish line? So let's look at our passage today, uh, and it's, 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 it's a call to perseverance, which in itself is encouraging. It's a really encouraging 20 verses that Philip read, so, so, so perhaps read it again in your own time. But the bit of the text that we will focus on are verses 24 and 25, which says, And let us consider how we may spur one another on, toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. I'm going to have a sip of tea. I don't think I'd be able to do that in church, but I can here in my own house. Now, the writer of Hebrews is encouraging the church to spur one another on towards love and good deeds. The writer is encouraging them to meet together. He is encouraging them to encourage one another because he sees what lies ahead. What is the writer encouraged by? The day approaching. And all the more as you see the day approaching. What is the day? It's the day of the Lord. That is our encouragement. That is what we have to have our eyes fixed on. The return of Jesus Christ the rapture of the church, the raising of the dead, the final judgment, the prize-giving ceremony. Paul writes, forget what is behind and strain towards what is ahead. Press on towards the goal to win the prize in which God calls you heavenwards in Christ Jesus. And, and this day for us this finish line is not out of sight. We can see it. 
because even then, almost 2,000 years ago, they could see it. And all the more, as we see the day approaching, it is within sight. The early church perceived just how close it was, and it encouraged them to encourage one another. And it even encouraged them to love one another. Listen to what Romans 13 verses 8 to 12 says. It speaks of love, but look at the encouragement behind the love. If you love your neighbour, you will fulfil the requirements of God's law. For the commandments say you must not commit adultery, you must not murder, you must not steal, you must not covet. These and other such commandments are summed up in this one commandment, love your neighbour as yourself. Love does no wrong to others, so love fulfils the requirement of God's law. This is all the more urgent, for you know how late it is. Time is running out. Wake up, for our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is almost gone. The day of salvation will soon be here. So remove your dark deeds like dirty clothes and put on the shining armour of right living. Can you see that the, 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 the purpose, the direction was to love one another, but the encouragement to love one another is because of the day of the Lord. Wow. So our eyes fixed on the Lord's return is the church's vision and encouragement. Hallelujah. So I have two questions that, that I'm not going to perfectly answer at all, but I'm just going to raise and talk about. Um, the first question is, why should the Lord's return encourage me individually to encourage others? And the second question is, when should we expect his return? So let's look at the first question. Why should the Lord's return encourage me to encourage others? Because there is one thing that every person in the world will have to face, and that is judgment. For the Christian, in a moment, we will be raptured and meet with Jesus in the clouds, our once corruptible bodies and, and our mortal bodies will suddenly become incorruptible, immortal bodies and glorified bodies. And what a moment of meeting Jesus in the clouds, meeting our Saviour, the one who we love, the one whom we've served throughout our lives, face to face. In 1 John 3, he says, Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. All who have hope in him purify themselves, just as he is pure. What a glorifying moment for us all. But following this meeting with Jesus, every Christian will then come before the judgment seat of Christ. Judged not for our sin, that's been dealt with, we've been forgiven, we're not condemned. But we shall be judged by Jesus for our works and how we used the gifts he gave us. And this judgment is called the Bema seat of Christ. And that's Greek. It comes from the, the Greek stadium where athletes used to, used to um, perform. And as the athlete um, finished his, his, his task, they used to stand on the podiums and, and receive their awards. It's the Bema seat. And, and just like the ancient Bema, uh, we, as we stand on the podium to receive our awards from Jesus, there'll likely be an enormous amount of onlookers. Um, watching us as, as each person receives their reward um, from Christ. 
and we will be judged for what we have done, both good and bad. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 9 to 11, it says, So we make it our goal to please him, whether we are at home in the body or away from it. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each of us may receive what is due us for the things what done while in the body, whether good or bad. Since then we know what it is to fear the Lord, we try to persuade others. So for some Christians, it will be a great joy and celebration, and we, we long for to, to when we meet with Jesus at the Bema seat, we long for him to say to us these words, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. That, that would be amazing. But we must be aware that for some Christians it won't be so joyful. To some, he will say, You wicked and slothful servant, take the talent from him and give it to him who has the ten talents. 1 Corinthians 3 verses 11 to 15 helps us understand what he means by this. He says, For no one can lay any foundation other than the one we already have, Jesus Christ. Anyone who builds on that foundation may use a variety of materials. Gold, silver, jewels, and on the other, on the other hand, wood, hay or straw. But on the judgment day, fire will reveal what kind of work each builder has done. The fire will show if a person's work has any value. If the work survives, that builder will receive a reward. But if the work is burned up, the builder will suffer great loss. The builder will be saved by like someone barely escaping through a wall of flames. And I don't know about you, but I, I know, we know we're saved. But we don't know how we're going to appear before the judgment seat of Christ. And I don't want to be making anything of wood, hay or straw. I want to be making things of gold and silver and jewels that will stand the fire of Christ at judgment. How can we be sure of what we're doing now? Will be it, we are things of gold and silver and jewels. And Derek Prince shares quite well uh, quite helpfully to me. I think something else to point out is that to God, quantity of works is not half as important as quality. The quality will survive, but we may have a quantity of wood, but it will all burn. So Derek Prince writes, as we consider this, this scene of judgment, and this is all for Christians. Each of us needs to ask himself, how may I serve Christ in this life so that my works will stand the test of fire in that day? And there are three points concerning which each one of us should examine ourselves. Motive, obedience and power. Look, look at motive. We should examine our motives. Is the aim of our service to please ourselves? for our own satisfaction and glory, or do we sincerely seek to glorify Christ and to do his will? The second point is obedience. We should examine ourselves on the point of obedience. Are we seeking to serve Christ according to the principles and methods revealed in the word of God? Or are we fashioning our own forms of worship and service and then attaching to them the name of Christ and the titles and phrases of New Testament religion. The third point is power. We should examine ourselves in respect of power. Paul reminds us the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. That's 1 Corinthians 4.20. Are we seeking to serve God in the inadequacy of our own carnal strength? 
or have we been renewed and empowered by the Holy Spirit? If so, then we can say like Paul, to this I end to this end I also labour, striving according to his working, which works in me mightily. Colossians 1 29. Upon the answers to these questions of motive, obedience and power will depend the issues of our judgment in that day when each of us shall stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Amongst us as believers, do we know any Christians who are still deliberately sinning? They are on a cliff edge and we need to encourage them. We need to warn them of the cliff because we love them and we know what lies ahead. As we've already said in, in our reading um, this morning, those verses, if we deliberately keep on sinning after we have received the knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice for sins is left, but only a fearful expectation of judgment and of raging fire. We've got to help each other. And if, if some of us are stuck in sin and maybe trying to keep that a bit private, it's not worth it. We have to deal with our sin in the church. We have to ask for help. We have to receive prayer ministry. Prayer ministry isn't about, oh, if you've got a bad leg, let us pray for it. It is also that, but it's mainly about dealing with our sinful nature. Is that God may bring healing into our spirit and our soul. And where we've got sin still stuck in our soul, that he may bring deliverance to that. It's worth pursuing this because of judgment. So that's the judgment for the believer, but how about for the unbeliever? Because there are three judgments. There's the beam of seat of Christ uh, for the believers, and then there's the sheep and the goats, where Christ separates the nations, and there is the great white throne, which is the final judgment when all the dead will be raised and the, and the book of life will be opened. And Jesus and the apostles speak extensively on this, on judgment. You know, have, have we really grasped the truth that unbelievers who reject Christ will suffer for eternity? Our, our hearts should ache for them because God's, God, God's heart aches for them. Because he wills that none should perish, but that all come into a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus, that all come to repentance. Now, at the moment, we, we, we may not be individually or as a church earnestly praying day and night for the lost, for the, for, for the lost. And we may not be earnestly going out there every day to, 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 to share the gospel to the lost. But, but now is not the time to, to be judging each other for this and saying, you, know, you should be doing this, you should be doing that. Judgment will come. But today is the day to encourage one another to do so. No judgment, but encouragement. Let us encourage one another and be encouraged to grow in these things so that we may be... Um, so that our gold and silver and jewels may be greater on the day of judgment. The other day, um, Sarah met a lady um, on the airfield in, on Harabir, and, and she was speaking to her. And when she came back and told me, she was like, oh, Tristan, I just met this lady, and I really wanted to share with her about Jesus. And I just, I, I, I told her you know, something about the Bible, but I didn't really, I didn't share the gospel. And I really wanted to, but I think maybe I just had a bit of fear, and I just didn't. And, and I had a choice at that time. I could have said, oh, well, that's okay, you know, none of us are perfect, and th there'll be another time. Or because I've been focusing on, on this message of encouragement, I wanted to encourage her. And so... I read to her um, a little bit of this book, which I had been reading that day. 
the day approaching by Emir Safati, an Israeli Christian. A little bit from Revelation 20. I read this out to Sarah immediately after she told me. I said, I saw a great white throne and him who sat in it, from whose face the earth, face the earth and the heaven fled away. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. And they were judged, each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. And then the writer says, this will be a sombre and tragic day. At this point, all those who have rejected God from Cain through to the end will stand before this judicial king. They will finally understand the depths of their rebellion. They'll recognise the heinous nature of their sins. They will realise the righteousness of the Lord's justice as it is meted out to them. And they will wail in sorrow as they are cast into the lake of fire for all eternity. It is painful to even write this. People I know, people I love, will face the Lord at this judgment. I can close my eyes and picture the terrified and remorseful looks on their faces as they hear the verdict pronounced. I can't bring myself to take that next step of visualising them cast to their just punishment. Friend, let this be a motivator for you to strive to live and speak the gospel to all those around you. Even if people reject or mock you because of your boldness, isn't that a small price to pay for the chance that you might play a part in rescuing them from this final judgment? The time is short. We must be about our father's business. And when I read Sarah that, she got up and went back onto the airfield, spoke to her about the gospel and prayed for her. We've got to encourage one another to do the works that our Father has set out for us to do. So, so why should the Lord's return encourage me to encourage one another? Because judgment is coming. For the believer first, our eternal rewards and prizes are given to us and we should all desire eternal rewards for ourselves and each other. And for the unbeliever, we should desire that they be saved from the wrath of God that is yet to come. So the second question that we're looking at is when should we expect his return? And I want to quickly look at the fruit tree here. Uh, the tree has roots, a trunk, branches and, and fruit. And the Bible says that if the roots are holy, the branches will be holy. And Jesus says a good tree bears good fruit and a bad tree bears bad fruit. And what we see here is that the roots signify the belief system and the branches represent um, the, the actions that we do. So what the message is that what we believe affects our actions. What we believe affects our values and that affects our actions. So what you believe about the second coming will determine the fruit that you grow. Because for some, the second coming of the Lord Jesus may be a far off concept. Um, you've pre-imagined yourself to die in a hospital bed in your old age, um, rather than be raptured up with the church whilst you're still alive. For others, they'd be living every day in its awareness, awaiting his return. But our view, our belief system, our stance on this, what we believe, the roots, will determine what fruit you produce from this belief. How many of us can say that the day of the Lord's return directly adds purpose to my everyday life? And what I'd like to do is just to, to ask a question to, to the church. I'd like us to just 
imagine, just for a moment, if everyone in our church family in St Andrews and Milton Coombe, if everyone believed with all their heart that Jesus was going to return within the next 10 years. Do you think that we would continue living in the same way that we are today? I don't think so. I think we would have a sense of urgency about us, similar to the first church, similar to the Apostle Paul. I think we'd be encouraged. I think there'd be an outburst of prayer that the church would be praying day and night, night and day for the lost, never cease praying for the lost. And then we'll be going out every day to advance the gospel, to share the gospel of Jesus, because the day is soon coming. The day is near. They must hear. And actually for ourselves, it will, it will drive us to live pure and holy lives. Am I ready? Am I ready for the return of my Lord? Am, is my heart right? Are my motives right? Do I seek his power? Am I doing things in my own power? It will drive us much further into the Lord. And actually, I had an experience the other week when my, we're, we're leaving our house here in, in a week's time. I had an experience the other week when my landlord unexpectedly was coming into the house. He was like, I'm going to come and fix your washing machine or something um, at, you know, in, in one hour's time or something like that. And I was like, but the house is in a state. It's not in a state. My, the house is, is not in a good place. There's, there's a lot of mould everywhere. And I was going to tidy it up before I thought he was, you know, before we leave. And so I went on a massive spree around the house, like cleaning the, 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 the mould of my, of my bathroom and everything just in case it came in. And that's, that's I, was, I was encouraged to clean up because the landlord was coming. So is it good for us to be looking and focusing on the second coming of Jesus? Many of us might have been put off um, from saying Jesus is coming soon um, with boldness and urgency because of some street pastors who, who might be holding up a sign and, and shouting. But don't let that affect what the word of God says. Jesus speaking in Mark 13 verses 34 to 37 says of, this, of his return, It is like a man going on a journey who left his house, put each servant in charge of his own task and instructed the doorkeeper to keep watch. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know when the master of the house will return, whether in the evening, at midnight, when the rooster crows or in the morning. Otherwise he may arrive without notice and find you sleeping. And what I say to you, I say to everyone. Keep watch. Paul speaks in 2 Timothy 4 verse 8. And now the prize awaits me, the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on the day of his return. And the prize is not just for me, but for all who eagerly look forward to his appearing. We are to eagerly look forward to his appearing. Philippians 3 verse 20. But our citizenship is in heaven and we eagerly await a saviour from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. As this great day is the church's encouragement, let us seek it. In 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 11 and 12, Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. We are to keep watch and have our eyes on the Lord's return. And there is a wake-up call going throughout the nations that the Lord is soon returning. 
Jesus said almost 2,000 years ago that he was coming soon. I think logic says that therefore 2,000 year, 2, years later, Jesus is coming back very, very, very soon. And we are to watch and pray. Let's focus on this day as a church. Let's be speaking to each other about this day. Let's be growing and learning and reading the scriptures about this day. We cannot come to an understanding ourselves to see the day approaching, but we've got to ask the Lord for the revelation. We've got to be praying to God, give me revelation of this great day that's coming. And God even says in the last days, in the, in the prophecy of Joel, in the last days I'll pour out my spirit and all people, your, 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 son, your, your sons and daughters will prophesy, your young men will see visions and your old men will dream dreams. Let's be asking God for that to come, that would receive dreams and visions of his return. Ask and you will receive. Seek and you will find. Study the scriptures. Read what different authors have to say about it. Let's be seeking it. Ask God for visions and dreams. Now, I'm going to finish now. And the concluding statement that, that I have, the take-home message, and please, please take it home, please, as, as we leave this church, please keep this alive in the church. A church that is encouraged by the Lord's return and all that it holds will be encouraged to pray together, to spread the gospel together, to not give up meeting together, to encourage one another to live pure and holy lives and to love one another. We are to seek the Lord's return so that we may be encouraged. So let, let me just pray. Father, we thank you for this message of your word. We thank you for, that your word is truth and it sanctifies us. Lord Jesus, we pray that by your Holy Spirit that we'd receive the truth of the revelation of your return, your soon return, so that we may be encouraged to live lives for you. That we'd be encouraged to encourage one another, to love one another, to spread the gospel of Christ and to live pure and holy lives. This is done by the power of the Spirit. And so we pray, Father God, for an outpouring of your Holy Spirit all upon the church in the name of Jesus, that you would open our eyes and our hearts to receive this truth. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Bless you all. You are so dearly loved by Sarah and I. Uh, we love you much and um, God bless you. Is a day that all creation waiting for a day of freedom and liberation for the earth, and on that day. Trumpet sound and the dead will then be raised by his power, never to perish again. Once only flesh.
to cheat.